the great steppe, millenniums of events, hundreds of nomadic tribes and people. They lived, worked, made discoveries, conquered large tracts of lands and left us some mysteries. To learn more about it, watch project called Enigma of the Great Steppe. The Library of St. Mark in Venice, Antique Collection of Books, Manuscript 549. This little book is really invaluable. It contains a wealth of information for historians and philologists, and for all who remember that they are descendants of the Great Steppe origin. We cannot say that it is a dictionary. We cannot say that it is a book of memories. We cannot say that it is a book of legends. We cannot say that it is a code. There is nothing similar to a code or codex. It is simply codex in the modern sense. Just codex used as enumeration, like some information called codex. Small volume of book consists of 82 sheets of paper and still has lots of questions to be answered. These are the controversial statements regarding the origin of manuscript and the place of its writing. These are specific linguistic questions. What do we know about this book? Codex, an ancient manuscript in bookbinding. The unique Codex Cumanicus was written in the early 14th century. It is one of the first medieval polylingual dictionaries that reflected the diversity of Turkic dialects which existed at that time. But who was the author of this Codex? Where, when, and why was it written? Cumanicus, well, the title itself has Latin reference. The word codex, if to talk about the genre, the codex, well, it is not actually the codex. It is like a big dictionary, and it is not even a terminological one, it is simply a dictionary. The first part of it is Latin. Byzantine, let's say, Italian part, it is simply a dictionary. Of course, if to consider the volume, it is a very big dictionary, very big for those times. It is clear that the main function of the dictionaries and phrase books is to assist in communication with the merchants or soldiers with kinyas, or barbers. The first ever dictionaries appeared at the beginning of the second millennium BC in Akkad, one of the ancient centers of Babylonia. Of course, they have been continuously improved. For example, a phrase book titled Treasure for Youth was published in England in 1440. The Codex Cumanicus appeared 137 years earlier. And there is no wonder of it. Actually, Turkic people appeared earlier than one and a half, two, five, or six thousand years before, much earlier. In the 11th century, Kipchak tribes crossed the Idil River, the ancient name of the Volga River, and moved to the west, gradually occupying the southern and western parts of Kazakhstan, the Volga region, the Caucasus, and the Black Sea coast. Although the document refers to the 14th century, the ground for its writing occurred much earlier. Genghis Khan had managed to create such a big geopolitical empire to create an empire, the territory of which took a huge area from Altai till Europe. From this time to the 15th century, the wide area between the Irtish River and the Dnieper River in the eastern and western historical sources is mentioned as dash i kipchak which means the steppe of the Kipchaks. However, expert of Turkic culture, Murad Adji, states that everything happened much earlier. By the end of the 5th century, Kipchak people settled the half of Europe and the whole of Central Asia. Turkic speech drowned out any other speech in Eurasia. Turkic people were the most powerful and numerous people of the world. In ancient times, Turkic people used to speak the same language that everybody could understand. About 2,000 years ago, dialects started to appear in their language, which only native speakers can understand. 
However, the common language still has been used for a long time. This common language has given a rise to the literary language. Entire states used to speak and write in Turkic. Kipchak people played a big role in the start of unifying. They managed to create governmental entity Kipchak Confederation. Мы до сих пор используем дефиницию понятия Дэшти Кипчак. Почему этот? We still use the definition Dash E Kipchak. Why is this word so stable? If there were not the processes associated with the campaigns of Genghis Khan, this huge area would not be called Kazakhstan, but it would be called Dash e Kipchak or Kipchak. There is a theory that this country would be called the country of the Kipchak people. Because in the beginning of the 13th century, the ancient foundation of the Kazakh language was formed. It is Kipchak language. It was so widespread and people not only of Venice or Genoa would like to know it, but also people of Georgia wanted to learn this language. The alliance which became famous under the name of Kipchak plays a prominent role in the complicated history of the Turkic people on the territory of Europe. It was far better to cooperate than to fight with the people of the Great Steppe origin. Since numerous Turkic tribes calling themselves Kipchak played a very significant role in the large segment of the Great Silk Road, of course people from Europe had to gain their sympathy. And the need to communicate was so great and experts wrote the Codex Cumanicus, scientists believed that the pocket scientific books of those years looked like this. That spiritual cultural matrix which was formed at that time has been able to save itself and it has gone through some tests, it forged like steel. Through Egypt, Mamluks used to speak the Kipchak language. All rulers spoke this language. It was Kipchak dynasty. This language reached the borders of the Pyrenees, the Iberian Peninsula. The dictionary incorporates and combines those languages which existed at that time. The international languages of communication, Latin, Persian and Kipchak. People of European countries realized that the period of Genghis Khan campaigns led to a break in the development, especially in the development of the Great Silk Road, which always connected ancient Asia and Europe, Asia and the West, Europe and the East. Therefore, it was very important to find the mechanisms that would allow to restore that dialogue and that relationship. This is how the Codex appeared. In any case, the first part of it, Latin script, is used for the Kipchak language. In Latin, Kipchak language is called Comanica, Kuma. In Kipchak language, it is called Tatar Tili, Tatar language. At the same time, Italian scientists believe that handwriting belongs to a native of the Apennine Peninsula. Let's imagine a little consumer version. For example, it could be written by Italian, but maybe there was a less educated or uneducated person of Kipchak origin near this Italian writer, and it was written somewhere in Crimea. Some researchers say that there was a copyist who was illiterate who poorly rewrote the text and so on. I think that all these statements are very controversial. One Theodosia merchant made a detailed list for his son which cities and where he could go, where he could travel by the Great Silk Road, how to reach the borders of Kog and Magog, what and where to buy, and what price to buy goods and where high-quality goods could be found, which goods were bad. And in the end, the merchant gave him the key, the main thing that he needed in life. He said, 
going to trade along the Great Silk Road, you should grow a beard and you should learn the Kipchak language. And what does the date 11th of July, 1303, which is on the first page of the manuscript, mean? Is this the date of completion of the manuscript, or is it the date of the last edition of the manuscript? The book was not written in one day, but during quite a long time. Официально считается, что кодекс Куманикас создан в 1303 году, 11 июля. Some versions state that it is the year 1294, and I would not be surprised if there is an earlier dating of this document, because most of events which were included in the Codex Cumanicus are related to the geopolitical situation that was in Eurasia in the 13th century. Во многом те положения, которые вошли в кодекс Куманикус, они связаны с геоэкономической ситуацией, которая происходила на евразийском пространстве в XIII веке. The place of the dictionary origin is also unclear. Scientists believe that the oldest part of it was created in Crimea, in the city named Solkhat, which is located on the way from the east to Egypt. Trade relationships were established here, and here was the residence of deputy of the Golden Horde Khan. For Venice and Genoa, it was particularly important that the cities which were located on the crossroads of Europe and Asia played a significant role in this. These were the cities of the Black Sea, the cities of the Caspian Sea. And the Codex Cumanicus was created in the city, which was a stronghold and a center of economic relationships of that time, primarily relationships between the Golden Horde and Europe. It is known that in medieval Crimea merged the interest of the three great empires, the Byzantine Empire, the ancient Persia, and the endless powerful Turkey Khanat, which borders from Korea to the banks of the Volga. Well, first of all, let us remember that era. It was an era of a flourishing trade. Each Florentine merchant, Byzantine merchant, or any other one, he traveled far, and of course, he needed to talk to these people. Where was this dictionary written? Well, according to sources, it was written in Crimea. Естественно, что ему нужно объясняться с этими людьми. Где составлен словарь, но по источникам он составлен в Крыму. However, the ancient Sarai, Hungary, and Theodosia also could be considered the place where the manuscript was written. But then, where were the other parts of the Codex written? There are suggestions that the last part of the Codex were written in the enlightened and developed trade and craft city called Cafe. The city was responsible for the economic relationships between Europe and the East. And here we have a very interesting moment. It is not an accident. Before the adoption of the code, there was one post mentioned in the Codex Cumanicus. Consular post was mentioned. Consul, whose status was equivalent to the status of Kazi, the judges in the Golden Horde. This was done to minimize the economic crimes. Customs legislation of that time was very strict. The questions, who has written the Codex, a monk or a merchant, a professional or an amateur? Where was it written? Still do not have answers. In fact, we can see that the Codex is divided into two parts. Italian, Latin, Persian, Kipchak Dictionary, and German, Kipchak German Dictionary. The first part consists of three prescribed columns in Latin, Persian, and Kuman languages. It is Italian part or book of translator. Again, here we have another question. Could a descendant of the Romans have a thorough knowledge of the Kipchak language? The first part clearly has a practical value. Well, firstly, the vocabulary itself is very simple. There are elementary words like ayak, foot, ana, mother, koi, sheep, 
kurt, dry yogurt. We have all these words in the Kazakh language, and they were in Kipchak language also. Of course, this codex was written with the help of a man who knew everyday vocabulary, who knew the Kipchak language very well. Besides trade, Christianity spread rapidly in that time. Missionaries, Franciscan monks, along with merchants, traveled to the most remote parts of the Kipchak steppe. And here again, the dictionary was needed. The second part also causes lots of questions. It is called Missionary's Book, which is a collection of various religious texts. And there's the German part, where the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, are recorded in the Kumen language, or as we say, Kipchak language. And it is clear that it was a missionary part. Of course, here we can hardly believe that it is a Kipchak source, and it was written by different people. There's different handwriting. I think it could not be simply written with the participation of the educated native speaker, because the Ave Maria is translated there, philosophers are translated there, and finally these Ten Commandments are also translated into the Kipchak language. There's an idea that a native speaker assisted in translation, because a missionary could not just come and translate adequately using the whole arsenal of expressive means. In the 1280s, a monk of the Franciscan order reported to the Cardinal Collegium in Avignon on the study of the Kipchak language in a missionary school in the city Cafe. Latin, Persian, Kipchak dictionary was rewritten for this purpose and it was accompanied by notes. Perhaps this is the time when the copy, which we have now, appeared. Original нет. Сам оригинал потерялся. Но какая-то его There is no original of the manuscript. The original of it was lost. One of its copies, probably the second one, was in Theodosia. This copy was with a priest who was preaching. Vatican used to send envoys to the horde. Уже Ватикан посылал своих послов посылал в Орду. Вот в данном случае in this case, the first prayer of the man sounded like this. Lord, let me learn this language faster and better, so I could carry the word of the Lord. Someone of local people, who did not know Latin languages very well, rewrote 60 pages of the dictionary for him. It is supposed the dictionary was completed in the 30 to the 40s of the 14th century, that is a few decades later than the main part. The manuscript was thoroughly rewritten, most probably more than once. Consequently, it could have lost its meaning over the years. The Codex Cumanicus is a strategic document which also was a key to the commercial diplomacy, and to the political diplomacy of that time in general. The question, was Antonio di Finale, who wrote his name on the back of the 78th sheet, one of the writers of the Codex or just an owner, who carefully preserved the invaluable manuscript, still remains unanswered. It is very important to consider the Codex Cumanicus from the point that it is a document which allowed to find the secrets of diplomacy signs of secret negotiations. Terms which exist in this codex seem to be related to the simple things, to marketing, to trading in general. There are more prosaic things concerning life. It is very interesting that out of the information gathered by Catholics, it appears Cumans were not godless people, they were Christians. Anyway, the missionaries really wanted it to be so. But was it so? The second part of the Codex has the prayer Our Father in Polotsian language. It is called Atamish. Religion 
Religion was acceptable for the local population because the Christian God is called as the Almighty who is in the sky. And the Kipchak God, Tengri, also the Almighty who is in the sky. And as soon as they heard the prayer, O Lord, who is in the sky, there was no doubt. This is our Lord. This is our Tengri. We do not change anything. By the way, in the 19th century, people in Hungary remembered the prayer Our Father in the Kumen language. It is believed that Francesco Petrarch held this Kipchak dictionary in his hands and studied it in five languages. Who knows, maybe put the parrot image on the sidelines of the manuscript while studying it. The parrot image is the only figure in the manuscript. But the historian Satar Majitov has another version. He said that it is not a self-made idea of the writer of this document and is not an autograph of Petrarch. This bird appeared on the codex sidelines with some practical purpose. The image of the parrot, you know, the parrot has always been associated with repeating. In case of some faults during diplomatic negotiations, especially connected to the serious trading, definitely there was a need to show to the person who used this document. We taught you when you were going there. We got you prepared. Kindly remember this. And this image of the parrot lets us remember some unfamiliar or forgotten points. This old book, Assistant of Merchants, Negotiators and Missionaries, somehow appeared on the bookshelf of the famous poet of the Renaissance. In May 1361, the monk Antonio sailed from the Horde from Crimea to Italy. Among the things, there was the constant companion of the traveler, a dictionary. We do not know what happened when the monk came to his homeland, but the manuscript went to Francesco Petrarch. Lost his only son during the plague, Petrarch traveled to Venice. And here we are coming to one significant point. What is the value of the book? What is the value of the manuscript? Does it have some value, even if it is written in language which you do not understand? In Venice, people met Petrarch with great honor. He was a famous poet. Famous means wealthy. But it turned out that he was not wealthy. He lived very sparingly. And then he passed his library after his death to Dosh, that is a collegial body of government of the Venetian Republic. Petrarch had to exchange invaluable manuscripts for a house and a lifelong maintenance, and thus the Codex Cumanicus became a part of one of the best European libraries. It is not a coincidence that there are 47 puzzles. They are of no interest for a simple merchant. But for a person who has sufficient education, knowledge and strategic goals like keeping and maintenance of political relations with this or that state, of course these puzzles have a great importance. Let us remind you that in other languages written puzzles belonging to that era were not found yet. Most probably bright, extremely short and concise manner attracted the rewriters. Manuscript is silent. One thing is clear. At that time, the paper was worth its weight in gold. So admiration for this form of oral folk art was so great that someone took the time and paper and decided to pass the descendants the pearls of folk wisdom of the great step. The other important thing is that this manuscript, besides the hymns, puzzles, and other things, has a hymn with music notes. Kipchak language falls into a rhythm, 
song in the Kipchak language is very melodious. It's the collection of the keys to the negotiations and collection of the keys to the promotion of interest. This document is quite relevant for today, and many people say that the Codex Cumanicus is Esperanto of that time. Obviously, this phenomenon existed at that time. I think it's the edited version of one of the most serious documents which did not reach us. There are more questions than answers. Is it the dictionary or fragmented books, or the collection of prayers, or something of more value? Someday we will solve this enigma of the Great Steppe.